All right. So welcome once again. Uh, let's pray. Let's begin. I uh, would just like to request uh, one of us to pray for this class for this week. In fact, you know, first class of the week. So just pray for God's blessings as we go forward with our studies. Anyone? I'll, I'll pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for uh, this new week. And we thank you that we are learning so much from you, your word, Lord Jesus. We thank you. Uh, we've seen your work throughout the book of John, Lord Jesus. As we study it, Lord Jesus, uh, let your uh, spirit be upon Nancy and and let her speak the word that we require. And let each one of us also to complain, understand, and and be fruitful, Lord Jesus, and let us do, let us help each one of us to follow what your word asks us to do, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this time. We submit this into your right hand. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Dave. So we've been uh, looking at Jesus and uh, you know the works that he did, the opposition that he faced even for the wonderful signs which he did in the midst of the people. In the last class, we saw how when uh, the Pharisees, the Jews, they were opposing Jesus, he talked about his good works. Okay, And uh, we see how he's trying to draw their attention to the good works. And he's saying that if you don't believe me, at least you believe the works that I'm doing. Because the, words the works testify of who I am. So the signs that Jesus did were also uh, an indicator for who God is and who Jesus is. So today, as we consider, as we consider uh, the works of God, which are being done among us, always genuine works, uh, genuine interventions of God, genuine miracles, they draw people's attention to God and they cause people to believe, okay, which is why we, we've also said that we must not neglect the works of God. So today, let's continue from John chapter 11, where last week we began seeing that, you know, uh, some of Jesus's good friends, which is Lazarus, uh, Mary, Martha, they are in a difficult situation. We saw that uh, Lazarus was very sick and the message came to Jesus. Lazarus of Bethany, okay? uh, that's the individual here. And then we saw that Jesus never really stepped out immediately to help him. Uh, and he took some time. So that's, that's what we observe. Okay, so uh, let's uh, continue from that passage. We've, uh, we've broadly seen what's going on. So let's see Jesus' response to this sickness in uh, one of his um, friends' lives. All right. So when um, Lazarus is really sick, okay, there is a word which is sent out to Jesus. And uh, he heard that Lazarus was sick. And we see that he stayed two more days in that place. Okay, that, that's what uh, the Bible says, two more days. Sometimes we wonder, you know, God, why is it that in that situation, you didn't move immediately? But we know he explained himself. And uh, you know, later on, he mentioned that you know, this is for uh, uh, the revelation of God's glory. All right. So he stayed two more days in that place. And uh, um, we go further, and then we we see how. I hope you all are looking at the the chapter because I'm I'm kind of summarizing also, but I'm looking at the verses so that I can highlight if there is something important or you know something that uh, um, uh, something very um, essential uh, from that culture or, or something that reveals the nature of of Christ. So, please do look at uh, the passage if you can, okay, along with listening. 
All right. So <laughs> he stayed back. And uh, when Jesus rejected you know, going to meet Lazarus immediately, uh, the disciples, you know, they, they didn't understand what exactly was going on. Because Jesus said something like, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Now, this concept of the dead sleeping, um, it, it is, I mean, it wasn't new because there was understanding of a final resurrection. But still, when Jesus said that Lazarus sleeps, the disciples thought that it is just, you know, your normal resting. So the disciples, so they um, commented uh, on what Jesus said. And they said, okay, Lord, you know, if he sleeps, then he will get well. At that time, Jesus clarifies his statement. And you know, he says, uh, uh, oh, actually, it says Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about Lazarus resting in sleep. Then Jesus clarified and he said, Lazarus is dead. So it seems like, you know, God gave him that knowledge uh, of what had actually happened. How is it possible for Jesus to have the knowledge of something that has taken place, you know, uh, far from him? Obviously, you know, he is being led by the Holy Spirit. We know, we are aware that Jesus was fully man, but he relied on the Holy Spirit for all of the things that today we rely on the Holy Spirit. We depend on the Holy Spirit for knowledge, right? This is nothing but the word of knowledge, uh, knowledge where Jesus has come to know that Lazarus is actually dead at this point. So he tells the disciples, don't know. What I meant is Jesus, uh, Lazarus is dead. Then he also adds and he says, uh, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. So you can imagine it would have been a very puzzling experience for the disciples. Why would Jesus, knowing that his friend is very sick, first of all, not go for two days, be aware that he's dead. Okay, and now he's revealing and he's saying, no, Lazarus is actually dead. And at this point, he's saying, I'm glad. I'm glad for your sakes. So uh, this is somewhat, um, uh, uh, you know, mind-boggling uh, for each one of us because we wonder, God, knowing that things are going to get worse, why is it that there was no heavenly intervention? Now, in some circumstances, you know, this is how we see things unfold. We may trust that God will intervene, but there could be some delay. And we are wondering, like, Lord, what is going on? So what we've been saying all along is Jesus was moving by God's calendar. In other words, Jesus was moving by God's timing. So even though the news came to him earlier and he could have done something, you know, it is likely that he prayed and he waited for God's timing to go and intervene in uh, Lazarus's situation. So at the right time now, Jesus is stepping out and he's saying, okay, come, you know, let us go to him after Lazarus is dead. But you see, in God's timing, there are answers, there are solutions. So we know that even though it seems late, when it is God's timing, we will see a miracle. So now Jesus goes. And you see a comment by Thomas. Thomas is one of the disciples. And uh, we are also told here that he was called as the twin of Jesus. Okay, he, uh, he was called the twin, rather. Now, why is it that he was called the twin? It is said that uh, he probably appeared you know, physically, physical appearance. Maybe he looked a little bit like Jesus. We don't know. Uh, but that's that's why he was known as the twin. Twin. Um, that word, you know, actually the name which Thomas had was Didymus. And Didymus means twin. So Thomas, uh, when he saw Jesus saying that, okay, yeah, let's go. Let's go and meet 
Lazarus, uh, actually Jesus did not want to go to that area because there were people who were threatening him and uh, uh, he would have walked into uh, some sort of trouble. That's the reason, you know, uh, why Jesus was away from that place. But when Jesus is going back into that same area, the Thomas makes a comment. He says, let us also go that we may die with him. So Thomas is aware of all the dangers of going back into that region. But you see the commitment which Thomas has. Okay, As a disciple of Jesus, uh, it was... Uh, you know, we, we see Peter later on, he is denying Christ. But what, we don't know how Thomas reacted, you know, uh, exactly at the time when the Lord Jesus was uh, uh, being tried and being beaten and all of that. But one thing we are aware, that there was a deep commitment which he had in his heart to the extent where he is saying that, you know, he's ready. Basically, he's very, very ready. He say, when Jesus goes to that area, if there is trouble, and if at all, we have to die along with Jesus, he say, let us die. So that shows a deep commitment that Thomas had. Now, there are other people who interpret this statement and they say, uh, oh, no, it's not uh, necessarily the commitment of Thomas. But he seems to be a pessimistic individual. You remember, even when Jesus is back, he is resurrected. Uh, Thomas looks at the hand and he wants to put his finger through to double check to confirm. So maybe his personality was, uh, uh, he was, you know, the, the kind who wanted to assess, analyze, confirm, only then believe. And also, uh, they say that he was probably uh, uh, very negative in his perspective. Uh, so instead of looking at what positive could come out of going to uh, the uh, region, so he, wa he was concerned that they might be attacked and that might be the last time for them to visit their friends. So uh, that is a little bit about Thomas and what his, his thought process could have been. Now at this point, so they are going uh, and uh, Jesus finally reaches the place and they find Lazarus. It's been how long? Uh, by now, it's been four days. It's been four days. So uh, it talks about the delay once again, the delay in terms of man's timeline, but the uh, time timeliness of God is not affected by the delay here in the world. So we see that it was four days. Lazarus was already in the tomb for uh, four days. Okay, And uh, we we see that the Jews at that time, so they had come and they had joined Mary and Martha and they were comforting them. So that was the tradition of the people. So four days, think about it. You know, here sometimes when uh, people pass away, the funeral is for you know, maybe a day, right? Maybe a day when there is mourning and the person is buried. But in the, that tradition, for four days, the mourning is going on. And uh, as soon as, you know, Martha hears that Jesus is coming, she went and she met him. Okay. But Mary was still sitting in the house. Now, Martha, when she goes up to Jesus, you know, she makes a statement and she says, Lord, if you have, if you had only been there, you know, my brother would not have died. So again, even you see that uh, Martha, she has faith and she understands the power of God, but it is likely that she is underestimating it. Okay, she's underestimating it because she knows about the miracles, she knows about all the uh, signs that Jesus has performed. But can Jesus raise a dead man? So that question uh, did not have, uh, like she did not have faith, looks like, to believe that something like that was possible. But she goes up to Jesus and she says, Lord, only, if only you were there, I wouldn't be going through this delay or, you know, I wouldn't be going through this sorrow. I wouldn't be going through this difficult situation. 
But again, you notice, we are told earlier, we saw, you know, Jesus loved Mary and Martha, it says. So at that time, did he know that Lazarus is very sick? He knew. But still, the word of God says, they're going through pain. They're going through difficulty. Are they going through difficulty because God left them? No. We saw, the Bible said that Jesus loved Mary and Martha. He loved those sisters. Okay, uh, While they were going through the sickness of Lazarus, and he knew that Lazarus was going to die, and yet, you know, he wasn't with them. But look at what uh, Martha is saying. She's saying, if you were with us, if you were for us, why would we go through this difficult time, Jesus? So going through a difficult time does not mean that God is not with us, right? Or that God does not care or that God does not love us. Not at all, because we have already seen that God cares, right? He cared so much for that family. But what was God trying to do? He was trying to work or Jesus was trying to work according to the timing of God. That's the only thing. So in our difficult situation, we must never believe that God is not with us or that God does not love us or God does not care for us because uh, God always cares for us. And you see, even in that time, you know, these days we sing that song, right? Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. It's somewhat like that. Martha didn't feel it. Martha didn't see it. And she's complaining. She's saying, Lord, if you were here with us, my brother would not have died. But all along, what is it that Jesus was doing? He was thinking about them. He was waiting to do the miracle. And he was preparing. Is it dangerous for him to come back to this region? It is very dangerous. But Jesus still came. Okay, So he is working even when Martha never understood. And so she complains to him. But you see that she's expressing her faith as well. It's not the faith which says that Jesus can raise him from the dead. But she says, uh, Lord, uh, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Sounds like she believes in resurrection. But then you know, when Jesus said uh, that your brother will rise again, you know, she says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So it clarifies that she did not, she believed that something miraculous could take place, but she did not uh, have the faith that Lazarus could be raised from the dead at that moment. Because she says, yeah, on the last day, like all other Jews, she also believed. Resurrection is possible but only on the last day. You know, it's like we put a limit on God. In our situation, sometimes, you know, when we pray also, uh, we, are, we think we are praying in line with God's will. But what are we saying? You know, we are saying, God, this is the situation. Why don't you work like this? It's our limitation on God. Whereas God is thinking, I will do exceedingly abundantly more than you can ever ask, think God. Imagine. So Martha says, I know you can do a miracle, but in her heart, she's thinking it can never be resurrection. Okay. Or she is not open to the possibility that her dead brother can come back to life at that point. So do we see that dynamics here. Then Martha, she says, uh, you know, then Jesus, he says to her, remember all the ayats that Jesus has been. Uh, speaking, making his claims to reveal that he is the Messiah. We saw that he claimed to be the Messiah. We saw that he asked people to believe in the signs, the miracles which he did. And at this point, again, he makes a claim. When uh, Martha says that on the last day, I know that my brother will rise up. Everybody is going to rise up. Jesus, you know, he uh, interrupts and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. To say that what 
can be done at the last day i am capable of doing right now for you because i am the source of resurrection or in other words you know he says i am the resurrection or uh, that he is the one who can fill us once again with life he says i am the resurrection and i am the life so he is the author he is the author of a uh, resurrection power of god as well as the soul life of god okay which he has been promising to the people all along and he says he who believes in me though he may die he shall live now here is the promise of resurrection those of you know the people those who have believed in jesus if they have not had a resurrection like lazarus okay, we know biblically it is possible it is possible when somebody dies for them to be resurrected from the dead but if something like that does not happen we know scripture promises us about the uh, resurrection of all the saints at the second coming of christ and of course you know we know that scriptures talk about the final judgment where everyone will be resurrected and even the sinners will be judged at that point so jesus says i am the source of that resurrection and i am the life and he who believes in me you will not die but you will live so that is why in scripture even when paul writes to the thessalonians he says okay behold let me tell you a mystery we shall not always sleep but we will rise up so he also uses the term sleep because in the christian understanding death is not the end no death is not the uh, finality over our bodies there is going to be a resurrection of this physical body okay and uh, we know that at the second coming of christ that is going to happen so what jesus was saying here was very true very true that anyone who is born again okay they will rise from the dead what a what an assurance isn't it what a powerful reality for us as believers in fact in first corinthians chapter 15 you know paul writes and he says if we were people who did not have the hope for resurrection you know we would be very very pitiable or uh, it's sad uh, to have a faith like ours and to be passionate about our faith because there is no hope so at the end of uh, uh, our faith walk what is our expectation so we want to have hope in god right? we want to have hope that we will see god's help right now here on the earth we want to have hope that there will be uh, a life after our death but if there is no life after death if there is no hope in that sense uh, it's really sad to carry on with that faith and that's what paul says in first corinthians 15 he says that as christians you know if we don't have hope of resurrection it's very sad to uh, be passionate about our faith but thank god you know we are not those pitiable people but our faith is real and even when somebody dies do we grieve their death we do we feel bad you know we feel uh, uh, that that pain of not being with our loved one okay that is human isn't it jesus we'll see later that jesus also weeps or he cries and that's also wonderful because it shows us that jesus does not disregard genuine human emotion okay he feels our pain he feels our sorrow but at the same time you know he is a god who has a solution for that sorrow we know that he has become our uh, eternal resurrection and the life so death is not the end and those of us who may have lost a loved one you know just want to encourage us that that we believe in christ that's what jesus said he who believes in me though he may die he shall live so our loved ones are not with us temporarily but we will surely meet them once again and that you know he goes on to say and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die again you know, it's an implication uh, for resurrection and he asks martha 
do you believe this okay and today the question is for all of us do you believe this do we believe this okay so anything about resurrection before we go forward about lazarus's resurrection or raising people from the dead okay if you do have uh, questions then please do ask okay we'll just proceed so let's continue that when jesus asks her do you believe this do you believe in resurrection that i am able to raise people from the dead martha says yes lord i believe that you are the christ okay uh, kiran has a question in heaven uh like can we know each other so akiran uh, i think so we can know each other because you remember uh okay uh like lazarus not this lazarus but the poor man lazarus we read about him right when jesus um you know talks about giving your life like living for god he talks about the rich man and lazarus in that do you remember we see that uh, lazarus is in abraham's bosom okay uh, so once he is dead he still being recognized so that in itself is a clarification for us that even if we die right uh, people will be recognized up in heaven yeah right good question yeah right let's move on okay now yeah so martha says yes lord i believe okay now when she had said these things um she went her way and she told the mary she told her look the teacher is coming and he is calling for you okay and uh, like theologians historians say that uh, it's interesting that martha calls him teacher because apparently those days you know um, uh, you had scholars who were mostly men so jesus playing the role of a teacher to women is interesting because again you know that shows that he went uh, he was ahead of his times he was quite radical that way so he imparted wisdom and knowledge even to women so martha tells mary the teacher is coming he is calling for you and as soon as mary hears this she also you know she was in the house maybe she didn't know that jesus was on his way and he had already reached so she also runs quickly and she comes to him now jesus uh, he had not yet come to town but was in the place where Martha met him, so he was on his way in route. Okay, and uh, at that point, there were a lot of Jews who were with Mary and Martha, who wanted to comfort them. And look at the kind of comfort that uh, uh, people brought them. We are told that you know, they were with them, and you know, we we will see that they were all crying. They were crying. That was their way of expressing grief over what had happened in. the family so they were there and they were also trying to comfort now these people they followed mary because she was running quickly right so they thought that uh, she's probably going to the tomb and she's going to spend some time there crying and weeping over her brother so it was a good thing you know when people have lost their loved one the culture those days was to be with them because you know it takes some time for that that pain or that grief to uh, exactly in their hearts so mary runs okay to meet with jesus now when mary came okay uh she saw him she just fell down at the feet and again you know she just like martha what is she saying she saying lord if you had been here my brother would not have died so looks like both of them martha and mary they felt alone they felt uh uh as if 
you know, God had left them in their difficult situation. At the moment Mary says this, you know, Jesus would have, Jesus would have just thought to himself, you know, why, why is it that, you know, you all, you are uh, not understanding my nature and my uh, deep love for you, even in your difficult situation. Right? So that's that's probably what Jesus would have uh, thought in in his mind. Now let's see what happens. So Mary also puts forward her grief and she says, "Lord, why why were you not here?" Um, and then you know he sees her crying, and along with her were the Jews. I told you there were people surrounding the uh, bereaved family, and they were weeping. It says, and if you just look at the a tradition the weeping would not have been just you know a little bit of crying but they would have shouted and you know how some some cultures they they like to show or express the sadness so they would have been crying loudly and just being around martha and mary and that was their way of uh, comforting the family but at that time we see that jesus he groaned in the spirit and was troubled so growth in the spirit was like, you know, it, it, it's like uh, the, uh, you could say a little bit of uh, anger in, in himself, not at Mary and Martha, but about the situation, about the situation that though there is hope, what is being played out on the ground, hopelessness you know, among the people and the Jews also, the way they cried and they made it, Look like oh nothing can be done in this in this horrible situation. But Jesus, just now he's been talking about if you believe you will, you know you, you whoever believes you will not die. So he's been speaking faith, but he's observing a sense of hopelessness, okay, among the people. So he's troubled. He's like people are not walking by faith in this situation. And so he gets to work. He directly gets to work. He says, okay, now just tell me where have you laid him? Because now he is going to uh, uh, see that miracle or command that miracle to take place. Then they told him, okay, Lord, come and see. So when they invite him there, you see the people say the smallest verse in the Bible. You know, John eleven thirty five 35 says, Jesus wept. You see, Jesus, though he is being rational, logical, he knows Lazarus is also going to rise from the dead. Okay. When we know that we are going to see a breakthrough in this situation, we should be bold, isn't it? But it shows the humanity of Christ. Knowing the results, you know, God, by the Holy Spirit, he knows Lazarus is going to come back from the dead. But just now, he has interacted with Mary and Martha. And it just shows how deeply he cares about what we are going through. He, in other words, you could say that the place where they were at in their grief, he felt it. And that is the compassion of Christ. You know, we've seen earlier that, you know, he saw every time he saw a person he saw somebody who was sick so we we saw uh, you know scriptures where uh, not in the book of john but yeah we know that he was moved with compassion and he healed the sick so jesus is one who is doing his ministry with great compassion you know that is the beauty of it all and just imagine if he was a miracle worker you no know, signs wonders miracles wherever he went he could have rebuked Mary and Martha and said, stop crying. Don't you know that I'm God, that I, I can do anything? You know, I will raise Lazarus. I want you to be confident and bold. I don't like people crying. So he never put down what people were going through. So in their difficulty, when they are experiencing grief, it's beautiful to see that the Son of God, who is filled with hope, who has come to give us hope, he still recognizes our humanity, our weaknesses. And that's why Hebrews says that he is a high priest. He is a high priest who sympathizes with us, 
because he has gone through everything that you and I have gone through. And that is so beautiful, isn't it? That Jesus, as man, you know, he relates closely with us. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And at that point, the Jews... Okay, Kiran is asking, is this the only place where he wept? Uh, it says he wept over here, Kiran. Uh, but I'm sure there could have been other instances where Jesus wept because he was human, right? Uh, if he wept here, my guess is that he would have uh, shown his tears and cried other places also. I feel so. Uh, and especially Gethsemane while praying, maybe, you know, he would have cried. But the Bible doesn't mention it again. Okay, because Kiran is asking the question, is this the only verse where... Jesus wept. Okay, so we've understood about the humanity of Christ. And the Jews, when they saw it, you know, they, they were happy and they said, wow, it seems like this man really loved this family. Others, they, they some of them, they are asking the question. So far, we've seen Jesus do so many miracles. Uh, do you think, you know, that he could have kept this man from dying? So they're just trying to think, you know, just like Mary and Martha, they said, this would have not happened, Jesus. And similarly, the people also were wondering, maybe if this man was here, he healed the blind man. Do you think he could have healed Lazarus also? Now, Jesus, okay. Now, again, groaning in himself, it says. Now, why is he groaning in himself? You know, this one, this groaning, we could also understand it as uh, we've studied in prayer and intercession, you know, travailing. It's a way of praying. It's a way of, you know, deep prayer that you're engaging yourself in. So Jesus stood before the, the uh, tomb of Lazarus and he deeply engaged with God. He deeply engaged with God. And this is a spiritual thing that I'm talking about, you know, not just emotionally. Yes, emotionally also he was very... Uh, uh, moved at that point, but spiritually, he is travailing, he is groaning in himself at the uh, death situation that Mary and Martha are facing. So at that spot, he comes and look at this. He says, there was a stone. He says, take away the stone. No, it is again beautiful how in some of the miracles that Jesus did, you know, he asks for people to have an action. Like uh, water into wine, he says, okay, fill those jars with water. So people had to do something for the miracle to take place. What if they had not filled it with water? So you can look at it in, in, a, in this way, that sometimes God wants us to take a step and then the miracle will happen. Right? Now, even the man who was paralyzed, he was lying at the pool of Bethsaida, you know, you get up. You, you you get a, so there is a sense of there is something the man needed to do the power was already released upon him to be healed but the man needed to take a step the blind man Jesus made clay put it on his eyes and you go you wash it so there is some action he wants from the people around there is some uh, something he wants us to do you know at certain times similarly he says take away the stone People do something. What if they never took away the stone? Do you think Lazarus could have been raised from the dead? I think so. I think Lazarus could have been raised from the dead within the tomb. Um, however, God wanted some action from the people. So he said, okay, take away the stone. The people did that. They took away the stone. But even at that point, you know, the faith level, it doesn't seem to be very high. So Martha... Uh, she says to Jesus, Lord, by this time, there is a stench for he has been dead four days. You know, look at the difference in the prayers of Jesus and Martha. At the tomb, Jesus is groaning. So in the spirit is travailing. And we've said that in, when we travail, we give birth. You know, Paul wrote that I travail so that I can give birth to. 
you know, the, the church or the, the believers that Christ be formed in you. That's the reason I pray with faith in a deep way you know, for the work of God to take place. Martha is also speaking to Jesus. So in a way, it's prayer, right? So she's speaking to Jesus. But it is a prayer of unbelief. What does she say? She's saying, it's a horrible situation, Lord. So she's saying, it's stinking. By now, there is a stench. It has been four days, as if God does not know our horrible situation. Okay. Uh, so you see the difference. Jesus' prayer is full of faith. And Martha's prayer is taking into consideration the environment, the facts. Is Jesus denying the facts? No. He never said what you're saying is not true. He never denied the facts. But let's see what he does. So Jesus says to her, listen, did I not tell you, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So Jesus is speaking faith. So when we hear you know, the facts, which may be discouraging, what is our uh, what is our example from Jesus? Jesus is still speaking faith. And he's saying, okay, I know. I know it's, it's challenging. But did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So he is awakening them to faith again. Okay. At this point, the stone is taken away. And the dead man, those days, you know, they would put the dead man in tombs. So the dead man was lying there. And Jesus lifts up his eyes to heaven. Uh, and uh, apparently there is a posture you know, which the Jews took. You know, they would raise their hands, they would lift up their eyes, look up to the sky and pray. So in that way, in the traditional way, Jesus is praying. And he's saying, he's saying uh, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Okay? So there is a prayer which Jesus is starting to pray. It's not a very uh, elaborate prayer. In fact, Jesus says that he already has the confidence in his relationship with the Father. So again, you know, where uh, should prayer arise? from a place of confidence, from a place of strong confidence in our connection with God. And that is where you know, Jesus' prayer began. Place of confidence. God, I already know that you love me, that you hear my prayer. I don't even have to you know, say so much, but I'm saying it so that the people will understand that I'm talking to you and you are the one who's doing the miracle. Okay, so that much of confidence Jesus had. And his, you know, prayer should be birthed from a place of confidence in our relationship with God. So Jesus prayed from there and you know, he went ahead and he cried out with a loud voice. You see, Jesus prayed and after that, what is he doing? He's no longer saying, God, raise him from the dead. But he is commanding the dead situation. You know, we see in Romans chapter 4. God is a God who calls those things that don't exist as though they did. So he speaks to dead situations. Right? So he spoke to Lazarus at that point, And he said, Lazarus, come forth. So, you know, it's a way of uh, prophesying. It's a way of releasing. Okay, I hope you can hear me, everyone. Uh, class, are you able to hear me? 
Uh, okay, yes, 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 you can hear me. Okay, let's finish this. Just a couple of minutes left here. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, there's uh, one connection is dropped. Anyway, it's connected to the other one. Uh, so, yes, let's continue. So Jesus calls out. He speaks to the dead situation. So we learn from this. You know, I was saying that even when God created the world, he spoke. Okay. He spoke to nothing. He spoke to zero and there was something. So in the same way, now the situation is zero because Lazarus is dead. But we learn from God to speak to dead situations, to speak to nothing. And life flows from the word and, you know, uh, God does his work. So that is why Jesus speaks to Lazarus and he commands. He says, Lazarus, come forth. And at that point, you know, was he dead? Clearly he was dead. Because we noticed that when the tomb was moved, there was a stench. So only when people die would they... Uh, would the body decompose? So obviously he was dead. But then when we read here that he came alive. Okay, He came alive. So I'm just going to uh, read those last few lines here. He cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound, hand and foot with grave clothes. Just think about that. So what a testimony. And Jesus did it in the sight of also the Jews who were helping Mary and Martha, right? They were with Mary and Martha when they were grieving. So in front of everyone, a wonderful miracle has taken place. The dead man came out. Once again, you know, we said that you know, God wants us to be involved in our miracle. So he told the people, move the stone. That was the first uh, instruction to the people. The second instruction here is, you know, he says, lose him and let him go. Why? Because to put a dead person in the tomb, what they would do is they would kind of you know, roll them with, with cloth. So for the work to be completed in a sense, you know, he wanted the people to remove that cloth. Okay. Now, how did he come back? What was his condition once he rose up from the dead? You know, uh, all that. Uh, we don't have details of it, but we know that he recovered and he was doing well uh, because in the next chapter we will read a little bit more about Lazarus and wow what a what an amazing uh, testimony isn't it that a dead person could come back to life and this is what you know, Jesus promises the believers as well you know, those who believe uh, we will see healings take place we will see uh, those who are Possessed by demon spirits set free, the lepers being healed, we will also see the dead being raised. And this is something that Jesus also walked in the miraculous, the supernatural. In fact, releasing the power of God upon uh, a dead person. So we've seen till there. Now, later on, what begins to happen? We would think that once people see a miracle like this, that they will believe in Christ. Okay, but not so. After this miracle took place, uh, in the remaining of, of this uh, chapter, we find that Pharisees gathered a council because they got scared. Okay, what, what did they do? They said, um, what shall we do for this man works many miracles. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. So do you see, I told us earlier also that they were asking the wrong question. Their question was more about their safety and security on the earth. And they were not concerned about what God was doing and God was releasing on the earth. So even now, they were threatened that you know, this man will gain popularity and their political positions would be lost. So we see so much of unbelief. We would think, wow, somebody came to life from the dead. At least now you believe. Because in John chapter 10, that's what Jesus said. He said, he said if you don't believe my claims, I'm saying I'm the light. You know, I am who I am. I'm saying all these things. But if you don't believe it, at least believe the works. And now Jesus has performed one of the mightiest works. 
that you see this ministry, Lazarus being raised from the dead. At least now, the Pharisees can believe. But what is their response? They are scared about their position. Okay, And they continue to plot against Jesus. At this point, let's take a break. We'll come back and we will continue with John chapter 12. Is that okay, everyone? Okay, all right, fine. See you soon, 10 minutes. Yeah, thank you.